All right, everybody. Can we hear? Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Welcome, everyone, to East Oaktober. We're so excited about uh, this little challenge. It's the first one of our challenges like this that we've ever done. Uh, it'll just be a journey through things that people are typically scared of, and uh, we're giving you the liberty to have the opportunity to try things, experiment thing with things, and the whole goal here is that uh, me and whoever my guest artist is at the time, which it's going to be Tina Figarelli today, so, and she's going to slowly walk into camera. Walking into. Yeah. And uh, we are going to be uh, working with assembling. Today is assembling a still life and to do thumbnails, which is the very basic beginning of what people should be doing, or at least a good practice to do, that I think a lot of people skip this step when trying to set up a still life. But if you can work on trying to get those uh, thumbnails to look really good in basically a binary or tertiary format of value, then uh, it should be far more successful later on down the road when you're actually building up. So we're not trying to teach here. This isn't like a teaching format thing. This is us joining you on the challenge to uh, participate with you. So some of these things are fun things that we said, hey, this would be a lot of fun if we had this as a, as a day that we just tried something. So we're doing it almost selfishly to try it ourselves. So um, anyway, please uh, tell us where you're coming from. Tell us that you're joining us. Also, uh, we have some links below. Did you put the, the Discord. Uh, Discord link? Yes. We have now a new Discord format. This is used so that y'all can uh, share some of the images as a community so that we all see what you did today on the challenges. And we're really looking forward to it. Each day that we do these things, we're gonna be working between like an hour to three hours, depending on if we have a live model, depending on if it's a larger painting. So today might not be like a whole three hour day. It could be like hour, hour and a half, just till we feel like we actually have a good setup because we're gonna be using the setup again in the uh, several days to come. So. Without further ado, we're going to get started. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, feel free to um, tell us what your struggles are when you're trying to do these things or what your fears are. And if you have any ideas for the future that you would want us to do some sort of challenge like this, we would love to hear about it. And maybe we'll make another one in the future. All right. So without further ado, you want to get started? Shall we? Okay. So I went to the farmer's market a few days ago really excited about this and uh, we bought tons of pumpkins and fall season harvest material and we're going to like use some of these we're going to take them down we're going to put up different draperies we're going to try a few things we're just going to talk through it and we're hoping that you do the same on your end so we'll have these reference images of or we just have a live feed on the can on the pumpkins we don't have actual reference images but you can paint along with what we have on the live feed or you can set up your own. We kind of encourage you to set up your own because then you can make thumbnails and do things, experiment uh, at your place of like with your tables and, and windows and things like that. So, um, all right, let's get started. So I uh, was really excited because there's a farmer in town that makes all these different types of pup pumpkins and they have corn and squash and all sorts of other things. And they, I got a big variety of different shapes. And yeah. I'd say... Should we leave maybe the big guy? <laughs> <laughs> this is live, everyone. You never know what might happen. Um, we'll leave... Don't smash those pumpkins. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, we'll leave like one of the big yeah. ones. And I'd say have a big one over for you that you okay. want to say is your big one. Yeah. And then I'm going to like set up... So we'll kind of have like two little sections okay. that might kind of overflow with each yeah, other. Yeah, that way they're like more cohesive. Yeah. That's what okay. I'm thinking, too. Ooh. Also, we got uh, several different types of draperies that we're going to be using to put behind on the background. But I'm going to try, since we have the light back background first, I might try this darker pumpkin as the bigger pumpkin on my side, like this, so that it creates a little bit of contrast mm. with the background. So, and then, like, one of the things I want to try is to, like, you know, give a bit of different shape, some different shapes to, to do this. So we've got some, some little squash, 
you know. Pumpkin the good thing squash. about like these squash that I was thinking about when I bought them is these are great ways to lead your eye into another spot of the still life, mm. you know, because they have like a nice Direction. long stem that kind of curls around so you can like play with the idea of how it would curl back into the piece, you know. Also is cool if you have it on a shadow side of something that will, might be able to like highlight it even more. In this case, it doesn't work, but. This guy, see, I feel like this guy and this guy next to each other, I feel like it's too spherical. Mm. So I might move this one down. I really like this, like all the, the dents and stuff on this one. So I'm gonna try him out too. Maybe lean him up like that. Okay. Also, I meant to take the corn. Yeah, I wasn't sure off. if you want them like bundled or however you want to do it, but I usually like having something like laying over the table. I feel like that's a nice way to add some more dimension. Mm, you that's know? a good idea. Yeah. You can do that with like also like tablecloths, yeah. drapery. Um, so what I would say there on mine, yeah, that's nice, Tina. On my side is you could probably put a white tablecloth on this side mm. that might have it come off and then mimic the or sort of echo the color of the other pumpkin. Yeah. I have that white one there. That one's a little large, so you might have to fold it. But that might be nice, too, because you get the creases in there. A bunch of things you can do. Yeah. I agree. I don't know. And speaking of, I'm gonna, you know, they always say start with the foundation, right? So I'm going to just try this and pull this over like that. And by the way, everyone, um, this is Evie behind oh. the <laughs> computer. Um, we've got a lot of people logging in and saying hello. Um, so hello, everybody. Happy October. Happy East Oaks-tober. Happy oh. East Oaks-tober. <laughs> when we were making the whole thing, I was really excited about the, the, the title of East Oaks-tober. But... Um, what I found out later is, is that um, my assistant Kelly and I misunderstood each other. And so it, she was like so excited because she had East Oaktober in her head. Uh -huh. And I had East Oaktober in, in mine. And ultimately I was like, you know what? It probably does have a better ring to say East Oaktober. So we went with that. East Oaktober. You know, I was noticing that because I was typing out East Oaktober. So I had the S in there and I was like, I don't think that's right. But say it however you want to say it. Yeah, All right. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So I'm wondering if I should do. I mean, that's nice. So I might try that, but I'm going to also see what this looks like. I'm take this piece of cord. Things that I'm like trying to consider is like how to like not make tangents with. Uh, my shapes, which is basically not having anything connect right on each other where there's no overlap. Um, just to also see if I'm mimicking any directional shapes before I kind of get started. Um, it's funny because I actually like this, this one here. Is mm -hmm. this part of your setup? No, he was just there. Okay. I kind of like him there because I like the little bit of a dip. So I might make one composition that feels like relatively large. Yeah. Oh, and, you know what? We have that white one because I feel like there's a bit of a gap, at least from this angle, between uh -huh. the green and the orange one. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there might need something light to match with your side because you have a lot of white. Oh, wait, like which side now? On your side, mm -hmm. you have like the white tablecloth and your white pumpkin. Mm -hmm. I feel like on my side, if we're going to try and make it like a cohesive still life, mine might need a little bit more light on like light, yeah. lightness, you know? Yeah, but draw it like it is and then we can keep adding and okay. subtracting and you know, even like my setup over there looks really good from this angle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, that could be really a good nice. drawing because there's that nice shape of that green and orange one, Yeah, you know? Funky so, guy. 
He's a funky guy. Yeah. I tried to get some like different shaped pumpkins to make it a lot more fun and create oh, some variety. Nice. All right, so here I decided I would do multiple different types of pencils today. So um, I'm going to do vine charcoal. I'm going to use a Sharpie pen. Uh, and I'm going to use a regular pencil and a uh, regular ballpoint pen. And the reason I'm doing this is because I don't want anyone to say that they had excuses um, because they didn't have an art, art pencil or charcoal pencil or something else. And you can kind of use whatever. And that's what I love about doing these. I don't know about y'all, but like what I like to try to do is I like to draw smaller thumbnails. And the first thing is I like to try to make a binary value system. So just black and white at first. And I'm going to just draw out a couple of these. So the first one I'm going to do, I think, is going to be, I like to kind of sometimes like get, get the square and then pull the square up into my eye like this so that I can see what it's going to look like. So I go, okay, so I'm going to put, because the background is kind of light, I'm going to put the top part of the pumpkin there and put the white pumpkin here. Oh, gotcha. Make sure everybody can see. It's the beauty of live, everybody. Just like easy <laughs> going. Will always be a little off. East Oaks, uncut. Uncut. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, what are some items that other people might be using? Also, I might bring in a few like me metallic items because they're kind of fun yeah. with these things. You know, it has some organic and then some. There was a few vases that I was tempted to bring in, but I wasn't sure how involved we wanted to get. Oh, we're getting involved here. We're getting involved. Elbows deep. Um, but for my thumbnails, I'm going to be trying out. So I have graphite, and then I also have um, Louis kindly gifted me one of his vine charcoal bits that I have here. Mm -hmm. So this one, and then um, sanguine I'm going to try to see how that looks, and also just like a regular ballpoint pen. So we'll see how that goes. I'm gonna start off with the graphite because that's what I'm the most comfortable with. And it feels like I didn't study for the test because I haven't done a thumbnail study in like years. So we'll see how it goes. Well, this is what you're doing, <laughs> facing your fears. Exactly. I should do more of them. That's why I was like, I'll do thumbnail day. Let's see how it goes. I'm gonna make, since that piece of corn is so dark, and make him, if I'm doing a binary thing here, to kind of see what the shapes are going to look like. So good to do this because then, like, you can see, like, what your, what the design of the value range is going to be. So, like, right now, if I'm looking at it, I'm not getting a whole lot of dark on the light. So, eventually, that's why I like to do a binary one because it's, like, this kind of shape doesn't seem good to me, uh, where you have all of this dark together, but there's no like balance above. So, um, so I think I'm going to change mine up a bit. So let's try it as a tertiary value ranking. So I'll do a, a light shade in the background. And then I'll do a mid shade for foreground here. Yep. We're going to change that around because the background is kind of blending in. So I'm going to try two things. I'm going to pull this corn out. Also, I might try a darker piece. I think I'm going to try This guy. Maybe 
maybe change it up where I have him over here. Just to MC a little bit while Louise mixing it up over there, um, we've got Gail logging on from Oregon. Hi, Gail. Hey, Gail. Uh, we've got Mustafa from Egypt. Hello, Mustafa. And Judith, uh, let's see, from Virginia. Um, we've got somebody from Massachusetts. We've got Kieran from India. Oh, wow. Thank you for joining us. Um, let's see. Another Virginia, cool. New Jersey, from LA, Florida. Nice. Thanks for joining, y'all. Can't wait to see what y'all are making. Yeah. Throw it up on Discord. Yeah, if you missed the introduction, we do have a new Discord group that we started. Um, if you're not familiar with Discord, it's basically like an online forum kind of thing. It's an app. Um, and there's different chat rooms and stuff that you can post your work and you can chat with other people also in the group. Um, we have a whole section dedicated to East Oaks-tober, so when you go there, you can upload your photos and you can just chat and see what other people are also working on that day. Mm. Sounds pretty cool, and I can't wait to see what everyone else is posting. Mustafa asked, who's the genius who created the word East Oaks-tober? <laughs> so creative. I, I think it was actually originally Erica. It was, yeah. and I think she said it as a joke because she like really <laughs> loves puns, and we're like, this is great. Let's do it. That's the beauty of having a whole group of artists here. You get to hear everybody's great ideas. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we've got Julie from France. It's very nice. We've got Arizona, Chicago. Virginia, Georgia, Florida. Nice. Thanks for joining, everyone. I'm really excited to hear that there's someone from Chicago. I was just there. Hey. Representing. I don't know if y'all know this little trick, but if you take your fingers like this, basically make open scissors with them, some that are down and some that are up, you can then make the square design, like the ratio basically, sort of like if you were to make an aspect ratio with your hands, you can make it elongated like that. And then you can like bring it back and forth on your eye to see how you would want everything to fit into your painting. So I'm like looking at it and I go, okay, and I'd like pay close attention to where my corners are and where the pumpkins are hitting on there. I go, okay, I've got, I want to make more room to, to, the, to the right so that the big pumpkin is hitting kind of off the center. So we're going to make this pumpkin smaller here. And then we're going to pull this pumpkin out, out on the side here. And then we're going to have the big pumpkin. Uh, Mary Beth asks, my table is not at eye level. I'm looking down at bowls, apples, and a pitcher. Any suggestions? Uh, well, actually, Tina, most of Tina's paintings that she's done are not at eye level where she's looking down. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to bring it at eye level, we actually put, we just put towel, we have hardwood floors, so we put towels down to protect the floors, but then we put cinder blocks. And the great thing about cinder blocks is you can do two heights with them. You can turn them up on their end where they're decently tall, and then you can do them on their side. And um, due to that, you can, you can get a much better um, uh, height, Mm -hmm. You can customize relationship it a yeah. little bit better. Exactly. Depending on how tall you are and how tall your table is. We have mine, I think, vertical right now because the table is pretty short. Um, and now it's a little bit lower than eye level, but it works perfect. 
which is great because I kept using the same table and then all my still lives were like the same level. So once we got the, still, the cinder blocks, I was able to raise it and then it kind of unlocks a whole new world of still life painting. Yeah. All right, so for the next tip, uh, if even if you have a light shadow, I always put the shadows with the shadows. It's gonna help you better understand the design of your, of your piece. And then the dark, the darkest um, colored pumpkins, which I don't really have one in here. So I'm going to keep all the pumpkins that are in the light feeling like in the light. And then the corn, I'll give a little bit darker just to see if that helps the design of it. Louis, do you normally use thumbnails when you're doing like portrait commissions? Uh, actually, I do do I, um, a color study that is really small for the clients. And so that's the closest I probably get to um, having a, doing thumbnail studies. But it helps them a lot because they get to yeah. kind of see what, what everything's feeling like. So I'm also gonna make the rest of this dark, this dark table dark with the rest of the shadow so that I can see better what, what the cloth will look like. Okay. Now, that's like my two value range. I'm going to just try with a third value range back here in the background. See kind of what things would look like. So, and as expected, everything is feeling a little too much. So, I am going to reset and do another thumbnail. The whole idea of this is trial and error and trying multiple things and then making a decision of what feels best. So, take this guy out. I wonder if I can have something small there, if anything. So, I might try to do something Trying like a little guy, like. Hmm. You know, uh, Alex Venezio, when he was here, we would talk often about sometimes the way to make things look most natural is to kind of roll the dice on it. You just take all the objects and you just throw them on the table. <laughs> I remember that's what we did for the the shallots, I think, for that bread two days still life that we did. Mm -hmm. You just like threw them right on the table and they landed perfectly. And that's because we left them for PFL. Let's see if we put some corn in the front. What that would look like. The goal here is just have fun playing around, get some more natural forms. I hope the sound isn't just absolutely cringing everyone on the camera. Uh, These leaves aren't as forgiving. <laughs> Christian asks, what makes the difference between a good and bad thumbnail sketch? Um, I think that one of the goals for what you're trying to do in a thumbnail sketch is to see if it is to try to find a simplified design that works really well. And if, if that's the case, you know, because sometimes it's hard when you have all of this like space where your eye just visually sees all of these different things. And, um, and so what I tend to do is to try to find a way to balance the value relationships where not all of them, for example, like this whole section is kind of grouped together, but we don't have much dark over here to balance it. So like maybe if I had a drapery over here, and this is the beauty of a thumbnail sketch is you can on your in your imagination go okay well maybe if I had a dark background 
you know, all of a sudden, you know, if I had a dark drapery behind it, that it changes the design element of the piece, you know. So maybe I have it coming off the side here. And then, you know, maybe the shadow comes up higher. And so I just start, like, you can play with it, and then if you want to, you can change your lighting accordingly and see if you can fix things that way. Uh, the other thing is, is by creating a square, like, or some sort of rectangle, it helps you know where your edges are. Because it's like when you go and look at a landscape, it's, it's hard to figure out, you know, you're not seeing through something. So, like, by putting this square up here and then drawing within it, you're limiting all the information you've got down to these few things, you know. So, so that's part. That's partially why I think it's important. When I was in art school, I also had a professor who would often do that and lay in a square before mm -hmm. drawing a gesture mm -hmm. um, to try to help with anatomy. Um, so that's something you can do as well. Uh, Benjamin says, careful shipping these, they might get squashed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done, sir. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got somebody from Washington State, and uh, we've got Esteban from Chile, currently living in Sweden. Oh, wow. wow. Nice. Glad to have you here, Esteban. Mm -hmm. Tina, have you worked with Sanguine before? Um, once. And I wasn't a huge fan of it, but I think it's just because I'm not used to working with it. Um, it's a little bit hard to erase and it tends to stain the paper which is a little strange. I think it's just because of the pigment. Um, so you have to work very light or else it'll stain it. But yeah, it's like my second time working with it. Honestly, this is one of my favorite stages. I'm going to switch over to a different medium here and do vine charcoal. Nobody can come up with my, the excuses that you don't have the right utensil. I actually love making my own vine charcoal this time of year in our mm. campfires. All you need is some sticks and an old Altoid tin. I remember when you brought a bag that you had made before. You brought that in. I remember that. <laughs> I have a ton. Yeah. It's fun to play around with making charcoal from different species. Um, mm. I think last year I made some pine charcoal, and it was really, really gritty. Um, and then I've done birch charcoal, which I actually really liked. It's really, really smooth. Um, yeah, if anybody out there wants to ever try making your own charcoal, I'd be curious to hear your results. Do it, do it. <laughs> it's the perfect time of year for a fire, a bonfire, so yeah. you, you know. Make some s'mores and charcoal yeah. at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's never a bad day to have some s'mores. Mm -mm. I once dated a guy um, who grew up in the UK and he had never had a s'more before because they're like a pretty uniquely American thing. Um, and I was like, that's not acceptable. <laughs> and I made him a s'more and it blew his mind. <laughs> it changed his life. Mm. Mary Beth asks, I noticed the subjects you chose are limited in color. Was that deliberate? 
Um, I, it, it, it is for the future because uh, my, we're going to have a couple of days where we're using these where we're working with different colors. And there's a day where we're going to like do the Zorn palette, but we're going to push the color. And then we're going to have a day where we have the maximum primary color that you can use where we then have to mute the color. And I felt like pumpkins have this massive array of color where they can be incredibly high chromatic colors like orange and green, but then they'll have also very muted ones. And I felt like that gave us a range of different color things to work with. And they seem to harmonize better as neutrals. So that's one of the main reasons why. I'm gonna do a bigger one on this one. Mess with this corn yeah. a little bit. For still life purposes, okay. I feel like it's also a really good choice because they last a really long time. So you don't mm -hmm. have to worry about like wilting or anything like you would with flowers. I think I'm gonna do a wider one with this. Get some. It's hard to not make this corn look ridiculous. I know, because <laughs> oh I tell you the, the leaves on it are so stiff, yeah. it's hard to get it to feel like an organic. I didn't think about that. I should have gone to the another guy who had them loose uh, versus like taped up like that. That's all right. We'll work with it. All right, I'm going to make this one a little bit wider ratio. I think that might be interesting. So I'm going to say we're going to pull this over here. Keep going a little too high when I start. Well, that's kind of fun. That little husk yeah. coming in front of it. It usually takes me a few hours to set up my still lives because I just like step back, stare at it. No, I don't like it. I just tweak a few things. It's just how the process works. Now, I know that a lot of people in different areas of the world do not necessarily, or Halloween is not as big as it is here. Mm -hmm. um, so I would be interested to see what kind of objects you would use during the harvest season. Um, at least your organic objects that you might use for your still life setup. Or for those in the Southern Hemisphere, um, yeah, I wonder what kind of stuff is around this time of year. Speaking yeah, of which, we've exactly. got Tersha, who just logged on from South Africa. Oh, nice, oh. yeah. I'm assuming their season is, is changing to summer soon, right? Because they are going from winter to spring? Right, I think that's correct, yeah. So many people, um, Lip King and Michelle Dunaway and several other people were just there having a workshop. I wonder if she attended or saw them oh, yeah. when they were there, because I think they were there for a decent amount of time. Yeah, it was cool to see all her posts with the lions. Yeah, wasn't it? That. And then my dear friend, uh, Emily Dietrich, went with them as she was there. Uh, posting a lot too, yeah. so. Alvino well, asks, do you use value to decide your composition or theme or story of your objects or do you just wing it? If you have theme or story with it, I think that it's important to do both to like make sure that value helps create, because value it helps establish design more than almost anything. Um, and so my, my thought there is, is that you would want to make sure that everything is working as a design. And then, you know, in addition to that, the narrative. So, because I, there's, there's always a way to express that. The narrative, I think, is more versatile in a way. Um, but the design is, 
is what's going to make it intriguing, intriguing to the viewer at the beginning. That's what's going to catch their eye and make them and draw them in. So, draw them in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're on a, a serious pun kick today. <laughs> So I feel like I'm getting a little closer. I might want a different object in the front, but I want to see what you're doing. Mm. Just making little, little basic. So um, I'm going to go through a couple of the days that we have planned this. If y'all haven't looked on the calendar yet, we got some really cool days planned. We have. Um, Three days where we're working with color study, and we're going to do crazy color day where we're doing uh, tertiary colors. We're going to do a primary color day called taming the primaries. We're going to do a day pushing the Zorn palette um, where we try to be very vibrant with our colors with a limited color palette. We'll have a day where you can only you only can lay down one mark with your brush before you have to go back and mix more color. Uh, really excited about that day. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so there's going to be a lot of fun, fun things to do. We're doing a day where we take a master copy. And I think that's on one of the color study days. And we're going to do one where yeah. we have um, um, where we take a black and white image, whether it's a painting or a, a photo, and you have to imagine the color. I think a lot of people get scared of that. Stool of shame day. Stool of shame day. We're going to have where you have to stand back oh, past a, a stool or a chair, mm -hmm. and you have to paint. The whole scene. Yeah, like we're gonna that. do a small painting so that way it's even, you know, you can't use the excuse that it's large, so it doesn't matter if you're stepping far away. Um, and I'm pretty sure for that day we're doing a floral. Yeah, we I think a so. flower, because that's, you know, where the stool of shame kind of originated with us, because I was painting a rose and I kept standing too close to my easel. That's right. And I couldn't see the value relationship and everything, so they put this tool there, and that's how it started. So it's come full circle. It has. I want to know if anyone else is participating with us. Um, luckily, this just like our painting from lives, these will all be on YouTube forever more to come. So, like, if you want to have a month where you just like, I want to try a few challenges. This is this will always be a resource for you. Mm -hmm. And I love vine charcoal because it does such a great job of like you can darken something down and then just push push your finger over it and balance it with the rest of the values that you're working with. Yeah, I haven't used it in a while and it, I was surprised with how movable it was. I've found that there's like this weird sort of controversy behind using the finger or using a blending stump. Uh -huh. And it seems like every artist has their own kind of spiel about it. Um, and I've honestly never understood why it's hmm. such a big deal for some people. <laughs> like, if, if you have a tool that works, yeah. then use it. Use it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the best I've ever seen someone use a blending stump would be Jeff Hine. He, he had huge ones and smaller ones, and he used it with graphite on Bristol board. 
and that's how he draws his portraits, is graphite, all different graphite pencils, but he starts off with putting down a shade and then using huge stumps to kind of smudge it out because Bristol Board's so good at smudging. Um, really cool to watch. Huh. Is that what he did for his workshop? Mm-hmm. That's exactly what he did for his workshop. Time, spend a little more time on that one because I feel like I'm getting closer to something that's interesting. Not there yet, but um, just kind of like getting it down and then trying to see how I would balance it. That's one of the beauties of it because it's just like you don't even have to draw what you see up there if it can influence you to get closer to finding something that works and then you can rearrange things accordingly. Yeah. I find myself making my square too small, but that's okay because I can just, you know, enlarge it and see mm -hmm. and then maybe redraw the square on top of it and crop yep. it again. Yep. Put a little stem up there just to kind of represent that. It's funny because it's because this is so small, it looks like the big pumpkin is just an apple <laughs> in the background. It's hard not to get caught up in trying to make it look like a pumpkin, but yep. it's not the point. Not the I point at all. I keep telling myself that. Yep. It looks like you guys are making like really dramatic comic strips about pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> Superhero pumpkin. <laughs> pumpkin man. Teenage Mutant Ninja Pumpkin. <laughs> I wonder what his power would be. Seems kind of kind of lame. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe he turns into a jack-o'-lantern at night. Ooh. Ooh, dun dun dun. Mm -hmm. Trying to see. I wonder if I put a darker value back here, what this would look like. Keep doing that. This tells me I probably should do that up there. That or have it so white that everything else is dark. Okay, I'll do a few more rearrangements. I'm gonna go get a metal object real quick. I'm doing this one in pen, and I keep forgetting that I can't erase it. I'm so curious to see how everyone else's still life is coming out. Who got this little guy? This is nice. Oh, the little cream holder thing from the tea set. Yeah. Take him out. I have one that looks very similar to that at home that used to be my grandmother's, and I have a succulent growing in it. It's oh, really cute. cute. <laughs> yeah, I got a whole set for free. It's like a nice oh, man. silver tea set. Uh, Denise asks, I'm curious how you control your light on the subject when using artificial light. I run into the problem of not having enough light for me to see what I'm painting without getting it on the subject. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I do a thing with lighting. I do a thing called flagging. So some of my light is, is controlled with... Um, See if that, that looks good or not. Um, some of the light is controlled with with blankets, or actually they're drop cloths, they're painting drop cloths, and um, and so that that helps a lot. 
with, with my piece. Um, and then I do a second light source for the object itself where it's controlled. So say you have a good way of doing that would be to put your still life in front of a window, like next to a window, if you don't have a whole lot of lights, and then put a, a light above you that you can then control. Say you go get um, some metal lights. I'll, pull, I'll bring up a metal light so you can see what they look like. So you can get these at a, any hardware store. They're very cheap. Like this. So I don't know if y'all can see that. Maybe. Hang on. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So you can get a light like this. These are like $4 at a hardware store. And then you can put a light in it. What I have found that you can do, you can do a couple of things. You can put aluminum around um, the light so that it funnels the light only on your, on your drawing or your painting. Or you can actually get some duct, ducting for uh, an HVAC system that's circular. And you can, it already comes out like an accordion. And you can just use that and make a small bit of it that's like that long, tape it to the top of it, and it does the exact same thing. So, and they make it in different diameters, so you can fit the right diameter into, um, into the light. And that'll help you control the light cheaply. I mean, you, that, at most, including the bulb, will cost you $20. I'm going to get another object. I'll be right back. So, I'm, I'm liking kind of where this is going. I just want to probably make this higher up here. So this thumbnail is going to get close to the top thumbnail up there. And I just make it go higher like this so that I can bring this pumpkin even higher. I keep making this pumpkin too big. So having to expand my thumbnail sketch until I reach the top. Here, we'll use this better. And then I have that little stem come up the top here. Ritza says she's so pretty, especially her bow hair. And his, and his beard is perfectly sculpted. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it might have had something to do with that. I'm going to be seeing all of you today. So I made sure that, like, my, my um, beard didn't look like I was a gold prospector coming right <laughs> out of the mine, but that it actually looked okay. <laughs> but thank you. That was yeah. awfully sweet to say. And Tina's actually included those bows in a few paintings, right? Yes, yeah. the ribbon I have, and I'm working on a new one um, with the ribbons in my hair. These same ribbons, actually. <laughs> Anytime I see that, that shade of like really light lilac purple, I always think of Tina now. It's like her color. <laughs> I just, I love it. I don't know why. It's always a daring thing, by the way, to, to do an ellipse and a man-made object into one of these things. Mm -hmm. it's, it's its own challenge. And anyone who's done still life here knows exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Well, it's the whole thing here, right? We're supposed to face our fears. Face your fears. The ellipses are Go scary. ahead, do those ellipses. I should have, we should have made a whole day of ellipses. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell how excited. Tina would be absolutely volunteering herself for that, that, uh, that day. I think I'm going to do one long one. Oh, that's a cool idea. Right? Yeah. Like, let's see. You're inspiring me. I might have to do that too. 
I put that candle in there, and I like it because it has more height than my right pumpkin. Mm -hmm. So it has some nice variety. I wish it was a little bit taller, but I can always just do that in the drawing. Great thing about exactly what you're talking about, you know, great thing is you can keep moving the drawing around until you feel like you've got the composition you want. So that's mm -hmm. what I keep doing with this thumbnail. Instead of drawing another thumbnail, I'm just playing around with moving this one in and out, adding some height to it, having it work with the, with the objects I've put in here. I was going to make a joke about um, the long one being like going into cinematic mode. But then I realized, actually, in the film industry, they do this exact same process. It's called storyboarding. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Exactly right. Yeah, the long one is actually really nice because you get that light gradient on the background and also on the pumpkins. Mm-hmm, yeah. Very nice. I think the inclusion of the metal works nicely too to have a different reflective quality in the texture. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, it's very true. It's, it's something about, um, it also creates a little bit of diversity in like man-made versus mm -hmm. organic and creating s different balances. Sort of emphasizes really... the waxiness of the pumpkins. Mm. Evie always has such good insights. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know about that. I try. <laughs> you do. Yeah, I do. Joyce asks, how much surrounding space do you recommend around the grouping of objects? Hmm. Hmm. I, I like to think about negative space as a balance, a balancing act between I always give the example of like the yin and yang or yin and yang symbol where there's a little bit of, there's like this movement of white, this movement of black, and then like a dot of white in the black and a dot of black in the white. And, and so I kind of think about that kind of balance where it's not perfectly symmetrical, where all the negative spaces seems to be working perfectly with each other, but there seems to be a visual balance that relates all of those and a little bit of the light and the dark and the dark and the light. And that's kind of what I always think about when I'm doing thumbnail sketches. So that to be said is when you have things going off the page or on the page, it's really to help balance the negative space in my opinion. Um, so, cause some people are like, make sure you have stuff going off the page. Well, I've seen very effective paintings where nothing is going off the page. And I've seen very poor paintings that have everything going off the page. So. It really, to me, comes down to like making sure that you are paying more attention to the visual balance of a piece where there's still energy involved in the painting. But, um, you know, it's kind of like you can use those as rule of thumbs to help you get there, but you, those are not rules completely in general, you know. I think it's also kind of experiential for the viewer in terms of like if, you know, if you have less space around a group of objects and it's very like almost like zoomed in, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, there's maybe like a little bit of a more kind of like intimate sort of interaction between the viewer and the object. Whereas if it's sort of zoomed out, and there's a lot of space, then, you know, you feel kind of like farther away and distance from it, which neither is good or bad. I think you can do either deliberately based on what kind of feeling you're trying to evoke. Yeah. I'm trying something different on this one where I just covered all of it in my charcoal and just like smeared it out. And now I'm erasing into hey, it. Yeah, I love it. And this is really fun actually. It's a little bit easier to get my values right. Too. All right, I'm going to try a bigger one because I feel like I'm getting closer to what I want. Might make this little guy turn a little more this way.
like having this like raking light thing happening over there. Wondering if um, make this one more of a larger square piece, maybe. So here's a good example where I'll take this larger square and just kind of take that, pull it out and see kind of what we're working with. I think especially like really round objects as a subject lend themselves pretty nicely to a square composition. Mm -hmm. Esteban asks, I'm new to painting and drawing and I hear the word organic a lot. What does that mean artistically? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, often when people are referring to organic, that what they're really your meaning is something that feels natural um, and not man-made. So typically that means that things will have a, a much more undulation to them. So like, for example, if I were to draw this on here, things that feel like they belong from nature, you know, might have lines that seem to have a natural flow like they would, an asymmetry to them that would happen in nature versus something that feels more, uh, often I would hear maybe the antithesis of that to be synthetic. So something that's man-made might be more angular and more right angle and structured, whereas things that are in, in, in nature tend to be more disorganized and at random, you know, where objects are further apart. Things that are more structured will have e more equal distance spacing and they might have um, more complete and perfect uh, circles and ellipses. Uh, but more often, you're referring to things to be have more straight lines and um, right angles to them, you know. So this feels more synthetic, you know, feels like maybe a side of a building or it might feel like more like steps. So one's not worse than the other. It's just what are you using, how are you using it to represent what you see? You might want to try to rep represent all of the synthetic world in an organic way that gives it a lot of energy because typically organic looking things have a lot of energy in their movement and things that are more structured might be a little bit more stale uh, or you have to get more clever with how to make them more energetic. So, but you might want to make organic objects make feel more synthetic and structured. So it's a tool to use to understand how you can perceive the world, I guess. Um, anybody else have any thoughts or insights on it? I think you nailed it, yeah. Yeah, that was a really good question, mm -hmm. Esteban. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. All right, if I were to do this in a square, how would I do it? I still think this lends itself to being more horizontal. I think that's other pumpkin. I'm going to try this guy, even though he's white. Mm, yeah, I like that one, and we haven't put him in. I mean, he's in. got such a great shape. He's so cute. <laughs> Look at him. He's very squished. He's got, he's got a nice little nose, you yeah. know. <laughs> Looks like he fell off the pumpkin truck. Oh. Yep. <laughs> I feel like he might make some really great shadows raking over the light Ooh, like that. From here, yeah, it looks cool. Looks really cool. How does it look on your end? It looks still pretty cool. Probably not as cool mm, as yours, yeah, but it still looks it pretty looks cool. It looks pretty cool right yeah, here. Yeah. yeah. Only thing is, is that that imbalance of white on that side. I'm going to try a different background. Ooh. Do you want to explain why? 
Well, the reason I'm going to use a different background is because I want to create a contrast relationship of the light pumpkins with the background. And so I'm going to try a few things. I'm going to try this more dark brown. Um, I'm going to just put this over top, see how it does. This won't affect your side, will it, Tina? Um, it shouldn't. And if it does, then I'll just pretend like that affect you? Hopefully it won't affect our wall back here. Mm. Oh, I actually like it. Cool. On my side too. The two-tone is also nice from here. Let's see how that goes. So for uh, all of you guys tuning in, um, I guess this could probably vary a little bit based on your screen. Um, but to my eye on this computer screen, the orange of the big pumpkin on Lewis's side is mm -hmm. actually causing a simul simultaneous contrast thing where it's causing the brown to look like pur purple, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of cool. It is cool. But that's another important thing to think about when choosing your own background colors is what's the color context of everything else all at once. Uh, right. Benjamin asks, what kind of feeling are you trying to evoke now? I feel like for mine, I'm trying to have it be relatively still and silent. I feel like that's how I want it to feel, but like relaxing at the same time. And I feel like the colors are already leaning towards that. Um, but I feel like with the change in the background, it also leans more towards that, has that kind of more mm -hmm. relaxed feeling, more stoic, which I really like. Stoic pumpkins. Stoic pumpkins, yeah. It's hard, it can be hard to add emotional aspect to still lives, I feel mm -hmm. like, because they obviously don't have expressions, which portraiture does. So you kind of have to lean more towards the lighting and um, just getting in the feeling of maybe some tension if you want the objects to be closer together then that tends to add more tension to the painting. Whereas if they're further away, they have more room, it can feel a little bit more like breathing room. So but. That's actually um, something that Lewis taught me when I first came to East Oaks and I was working on my skull study drawing. Mm -hmm. Um, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember. It was like I was working on some shadow shape on the mandible and he had me describe it as like an emotion. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And that act of personification really helps kind of wrap my brain around how exactly that angle was supposed to look. Mm -hmm. Like, is it a happy angle? Is it a sad angle? So I think sort of the same thing applies with a still life where you're like, oh, this is a stoic pumpkin rather yeah. than a loud pumpkin. You yeah. Know? yeah. Um, I think, I that's think really it really cool. helps. That's awesome. Yes. All of you guys out there, you should uh, share what kind of adjectives and emotions you can <laughs> yeah, no kidding. describe your still lives with. Oh, I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> Another thing that I try to think about is not necessarily like the emotion thing, but what who's the lead role of the mm. of the still life? Like you need you need a central object or an object that takes center stage of attention, not necessarily center stage of the you know the composition, but definitely one that that feels like this is the object that you're trying to say is the focal point. Mm 
That's another thing I'm trying to think about when I'm composing. Yeah. It's like, so like assign importance mm -hmm. to who wants to be the main character and who's more of like a supporting role. I was yeah. going to say supporting role. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and like in my thumbnail that I'm working on right now, I'm adjusting it to make this little white pumpkin the star, even though technically this white tablecloth is going to be brighter. Mm. But I'm going to compress it so that way I can make this guy shine because that's where I want the main focus point to be. And I might have this be the supporting role. And that brings up a really good point too, Tina, that you know, you're lead actor, so to speak, doesn't have to be necessarily the biggest thing in no. painting. You know, yeah. sometimes it's really compelling for it to be really small in scale in comparison. Absolutely. That can have a very powerful impact to have the small object be the one that is the focus. Joyce asks, so on Lewis's current thumbnail, the orange pumpkin is your star? Uh, at this moment, um, he is, or it is, because um, he's, he's got a dominant presence. Um, and I have him relatively centered where most of him is showing. Um, but I, I kind of like the idea of if, if I made this larger, say I made this piece where the pumpkin was taking up this much of the space, where it was that big, then all of a sudden the, the focal point, you could make the one single man-made object because it's the darkest, and you could really deepen that value low. And then you could make like, this either the one next to it or this white pumpkin to be more of the uh, star of the show, you know. So how about we do that? I mean, we're having fun here. Let's do that. So now the big pumpkin is not, he's so large that he's becoming, assuming almost the background. And then we're going to make this object come larger. And this object is going to be, this pumpkin is going to be even larger. And so now the center of the, of the, or the focal point of the pieces is the metal was it a, a cream? Yeah, it's like a the a cream, cream pitcher. Yeah, of a tea set. Cream holder. I don't know the term. Yeah, I'd... I should know. What What is uh, asking the audience out there? What do you <laughs> call the that holds the creamer that you pour on a tea set? I thought it was just called a creamer. <laughs> it, may, it might it be. It might be, but I thought it, it just... It feels wrong. It does feel wrong in the sense in my head that it, it, I, I feel like creamer is what's in it. Oh, you know. Um, actually, I think it's called a ewer. Oh. A ewer? Yeah, E-W-E-R. E oh, That's a interesting. Pottery thing. Ah. Yeah. ah. I love how you just pulled that right out of your yeah. brain. <laughs> You're sometimes like, hold on, let me put my, the pottery hat on. Sometimes my degree actually comes in handy for once. <laughs> I think it's it's fun what Lewis is doing to think about in terms of um, using objects as setting rather than subject. Um, like using the larger pumpkins to contextualize the sugar bowl or creamer or whatever it is. Yeah, it can make it really fun that way, you know. Um, I think somebody that does it very effectively is Daniel Keyes in his work. He He'll, he has so much pattern and texture in, throughout the whole piece, but it'll be a center object like a pitcher or 
or um, you know, a teacup or something like that in his work that he's saying, this the smaller objects, the thing I want you to focus on, you know. Um. Gail asks a really good question. Um, they say, my thumbnails just keep turning out as small sketches with too many values, having a hard time keeping to three values. I tried a smaller format, but they're still too complicated. Any suggestions? Uh, the first suggestion, like I said earlier, is to make your shadows and your dark values of like your dark objects. If the object is darker than, your sh than the average shadow, then it should be considered part of the shadow. You know, and so like for example, in this instance, I would make the picture part of the shadow of, of the pump side of the pumpkin. And even though this, the large pumpkin has, is particularly light, the shadow side of it, I'm still going to make into an, uh, an equal value range like that. And then I'm gonna make the background into a shadow too. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull the background as a darker. If I'm just making two, a two value system. And then that way I can start seeing what's light and what's dark. And so I, I'm squinting down and I notice that the tabletop is almost um, in shadow two. So what works with this particular drawing is notice that like, even though like we can't tell what the objects are anymore, the shape that this makes helps, helps a really interesting design shape. So if I'm thinking of it as like a, a, a piece of modern work, which modern art typically is using design more than they're using the object, right? That's what abstract means, mm -hmm. to abstract your objects to a point of beyond recognition, you know, um, is the original term for abstraction. And so like this makes a really interesting balance between the lights and the darks because the lights have this round shape to them right here. And this, and this light has an, an interesting round shape to it. But then the shadows are just the opposite. They're like, they're concave in shape nature while the light objects are convex in shape nature. But they, they, they carry about the same amount of balance of light to dark. So, so that, that tells me that's a, a decent, strong composition because it feels organic in the sense that there's multiple different shapes in different places that feel at random, but they all balance from dark to light and negative and positive space. So from there I go, okay, well that means it's probably gonna be a stronger composition. So then I can add a third value in, and if I were to add a third value in, I'd add it onto the shadow side of the, of the big pumpkin. And then I'd pull it down and then add, um, trying to maintain the idea of that uh, dark and light relationship, even though I'm about to add like a third value in here. Hopefully that was helpful for you. And I actually really liked how my long one came out. I'm gonna leave that, because I think I might stick with that one, but I just wanna see how it would look if I did a long vertical. Mm. Just try and think about it. Yeah. In fact, what I'm gonna do here in a second is I'm gonna take out the big pumpkin entirely and see. Ooh, the, the orange one? Yeah, and see what negative space I can create mm. um, without it.
Another one of our days that I'm really excited about is our soft, soft and hard edge day, mm. where you have to start completely soft and then work your way into harder edges oh, later. I think, I think I'm doing that day with you. Woo! If I remember correctly. <laughs> It'll be fun. It's going to be a blast. Yeah. Tomorrow is value study day? Yeah, uh-huh. Okay. So we're basically going to take the idea of these thumbnails and, and go the next step further. Um, Amira asks, Louis, do you prefer photo-based painting or live painting? What I see is you take more time compared to others. I'm also a slow painter compared to my friends here. Um, I, I paint from photos so much that I much prefer life. Um, I think most people, regardless if they paint from photo a lot or not, uh, prefer from life uh, on average. But I prefer to paint from life because things end up having a bit more of an energy that you have to make faster decisions. And sometimes that's actually helpful for making the painting feel more energetic. Um, so that for that reason, I enjoy it. But I also have found that typically when you're painting from life, you're either painting with somebody or you're painting a model. And if that's the case, I'm, I'm a social guy. I enjoy having people in the room with me. So it gives you somebody to talk to. And for that reason, I like it a lot too. It's one of my main reasons for loving painting from life. Cool, now I'm gonna try something totally different. Make that one more. Little dark crease as it goes down. Cool. Let's take you out. Let's see. What we can do instead. Really liked that part of the setup though, so let's see what I can make happen there. And this is totally unrelated, but this is what I'm thinking about while I'm doing this. Um, since it's coming up for Halloween, I've been recently watching a show on Netflix called The Haunting of Hill House. Have Ooh. either of you seen it? <clears throat> you need to watch it. It's so good. Um, it's like haunted house style TV show, but really well done. So everyone out there, if you need something to watch to get yourself in the mindset for Halloween, there's a great TV show, and I can't wait to watch it when I get home tonight. Oh, cool. <laughs> that reminds me, one of my favorite board games growing up was called Betrayal at House on the Hill. Ooh. Um, I wonder if it, I don't know, has anything to do with that. I don't know. That. I know it's based off a book. So I think it's The Haunting of Hill House, okay. but they've redone it as a TV Which show. Which is funny, because it there's one called The House on a Haunted Hill, isn't there? Oh, geez. Too many hills. I, I don't know. And then there's like the sequel that's like Haunting at Bly Manor. It's like a bunch, <laughs> so. <laughs> but really good. Lots of jump scares, though. Just be prepared. That reminds me. I think it, I think it was this time last year, maybe. Um, my fiance and I stayed up all night watching this Netflix show called The Watcher. Um, oh, yeah. We, we could not put it down, and then we couldn't sleep because we were so freaked out. Yep. <laughs> I've seen a few episodes. I think, isn't it by the same guy who did American Horror Story? Maybe. Brian Murphy, because it has the same feeling. I've actually never seen American Horror Story. I haven't either. It's, you know, it's... It's own taste. It's an acquired <laughs> taste. I've seen the first four. I liked Coven. 
like a coven of witches set in New Orleans. Oh, cool. It was, it was pretty good. I like that one. Um, but then I, I haven't watched any of the recent ones. I'm going to figure out how to get this guy to stay up. Because I really like him up. But. Oh, you trying to get him propped? Yeah. Yeah. Might, might not happen, though. Uh, Jean asks, tomorrow I have class, so I can't watch live. Will these be available online later as well? And the answer is yes. Um, these are all going to be available to watch on YouTube for free, um, just like all of our PFL sessions n normally are. Um, so feel free to watch at your leisure. Yeah, they'll be on their own playlist. Mm -hmm. You know, the good thing about doing these kinds of things, people have no clue how long we take setting up a still life to make it feel like something dynamic. Oh, truly. I wish it was easy. Yeah. yeah. It's not. I mean, that could, that could be like a session in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. Truly. Honestly. It wouldn't probably be the most entertaining, but yep. just be shuffling stuff around on a table. But you'll at least see what we're doing. Yeah, and why. I'm scared if I move anything, everything's going to slide oh, and fall God. apart. <laughs> Live on camera. Yep. Smashing pumpkins. There you go. For that reason, I might actually put a dark cloth down first. That'll also get rid of the warm in the background and the warm in the foreground. So we'll put this cloth down. Y'all know once these paintings are done, we're going to have to make a lot of pies. Oh, man. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm fine with that. It was like when we did the bread still life and we had a lot of bread afterwards. Oh man, we, we ate bread for days. It's good bread. It was really good bread. Yeah, that's one of, that's a, like a little extra incentive to paint food mm -hmm. <laughs> objects is to get a <laughs> yummy snack out of it. <laughs> Let's see, that stays a lot better now. Joyce says, I see Lewis exchanging rent-sized pumpkins. What is your thinking process? <laughs> oh, I mean different-sized pumpkins. <laughs> oh, different size? Like, <laughs> rent-sized oh, no. pumpkins, okay. <laughs> um, you know, in this I market, wish my yeah, rent was like maybe it's still cheap. accurate. A metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, my thought process, I'm just trying different things, you know. Um, I'm, like, I'm thinking of the pumpkins as like, almost like Legos, you, you can do it in a million different ways, the same thing. So I'm just trying to play with, if I didn't have like a big central pumpkin, how would I set this up, you know? So, or if I had a central pumpkin, would it be like way out of, of the scene? You know, what would it look like? So just kind of like working with ideas and balancing them and seeing kind of what seems to work. It's part of the fun of it in a way. At least I enjoy it. It's like solving a pumpkin puzzle. <laughs> it is. The funny thing is I often find myself setting it up a certain way, but then I'll get to a different vantage point and I go, oh, that's way more interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, okay, now I need to set up that vantage point for me, 
you know, at the vantage point, at the direction I actually am looking. Otherwise, it's, I'd set it up, but I have cameras on this spot. Otherwise, I'd set it up, you know, my spot in that vantage point. Yeah. These corn's probably pretty big for this. But I like the idea of threading this through. What are some of the fears that you have, our audience, when it comes to painting? Tell me some of the things that you're scared to try. Um, you know, maybe in the future we'll have a, some way of, of you know, debugging or diffusing the fear. So I bet you this earthy pot would look good somewhere in here. Might be too much. Mm. Fun fact, Lewis there. made that pot. I Aww. did, I did make this, yeah. Long time ago. Jars are really hard to get right. The, um, what's the, the lid, so mm. hard to do. Mm -hmm. To get them fitted right and then fitted the same when they're fired. Oh yeah, mm. oh man. You know, sometimes my issue is always getting too elaborate. And so I have to like, be like, you know what? Sometimes it's, you know, the KISS method is the best Keep method. It Keep it simple, stupid. Mary Beth says uh, one of her fears are drawing imaginary scenes or people, like drawing a dragon or something. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Drawing from your imagination. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah. Well, we're going to do making up color from your imagination. That might be a good yep. way to ease into it. How long do y'all take setting up your still lives? I most certainly am taking plenty of time. I'm trying to think if I want to change mine. I might want to flip some things around. I'm so tempted to bring one of my skulls in. You should. Yeah? Why not? Why not? I mean, it is October. Yeah, I have a raccoon skull just waiting for me. I'm amazing. Oh, man. Let's go. I gotta go this way. Okay. For those who may not know, Tina and I both have many, many skulls okay. littering our I'm studio sorry. spaces. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. There's only one pathway through this. I feel like that's seasonally appropriate, too. I'm, I'm um, having a dilemma between wanting more of the orange of this pumpkin, but loving the shape of it tilting down and this tilting up, and playing with that idea. Joyce asks, what size and shape difference drive your setup decisions? What size is what? What size and shape differences drive your setup decisions? Well, um, that's a really good question, actually, because it, it does drive my decisions a lot. 
what I try to do is I try to create a variety of shapes and where none of them are necessarily competing with each other shape-wise. Um, so I try to create things that don't repeat the same shape. So like, for example, this, this piece is this uh, white pumpkin, saucer-style pumpkin, is taking this shape, basically. And then this one is got a different angle. So this angle is more like this. This angle is more like that. And it creates a relationship that helps make things feel interesting and more dynamic. So that's one of the things I'm thinking of. Um, they the kind other, of look like they're snuggling. Kind of do look like they're yeah. snuggling. They're Snuggly friends. Snuggly pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and then like, I actually kind of like this little pumpkin over here on the side that's underneath it because, you know, it's almost like you could title it to being something about this pumpkin supporting these guys. And then all of a sudden, no one would have paid attention to this little guy until they would have seen the title of this piece. You know, So that's one thing I'm thinking of. And the other thing I'm thinking of is um, the shape, the size relationship. This one is, um, is a the, they, these are about equal weight and size, and that's the only thing that actually concerns me about this, this composition that I was trying to like get away from. I was trying to think about the size relationship of this one to this one, and I was hoping that the shadow would help cut the size down on one of them. So, for example, this one. So that this one was the larger, more dominant pumpkin even though they're relatively probably in volume-wise equal to each other. So by foreshortening this over here, by having this one be mostly in shadow over here, maybe I can make it work. And then, you know, say I have this basic shape down here, one of the things I'll do is I'll try different compositions and see what seems to work better. So that composition works way better than the one I just had as far as like the square where things are fitting. Because then you've got this interesting negative shape on the back side here that we're going to color in. And then we have this interesting shape on the foreground here that we're going to color in. And then we have, you know, maybe you could even say, if I made it wider here, I could add this piece of corn in and then create this as a negative space where there's light, a bit of light in the background on that dark side of the pumpkin. So all of a sudden we've got more of a, an elongated composition that seems to really work. You know, and I bet you if I put this in like a dynamic symmetry grid, this would, this would end up having a little bit of, you know, play with the dynamic symmetry grid, you know. So if I were to draw lines that go across here and down here, across there, centered, and then have these go across like this. This has um, a little bit of mimicking of those lines. So... All of this kind of goes into that dynamic symmetry of positioning. So, so that part, I think, works really well in this painting, in this uh, drawing. Chris says he has a fear of color mixing with slight color blindness. It's really Ooh. interesting. I actually have a friend from college who's a really amazing painter who is colorblind. Perhaps that could be your superpower. Yeah. <laughs> there are actually several famous painters that are colorblind, too. So uh, lean into it. Use that as part of your story. What I would say. Um, that definitely... You know, the saying goes that 
Color gets all the credit, but value does all the work. And every colorblind person is able to see all the value. So if the value does all the work, then you are 90% there on making beautiful paintings. So what I would say is, in fact, um, one of my former mentees was colorblind, and he makes wonderful paintings. And this kind of ties back into um, what we were talking about earlier uh, with the term organic. Uh, Benjamin says, I'm afraid to paint architecture. How do I make that kind of geometry organic? Ooh. Yeah, that's tough. I feel so much about that is to do with like context. Like what, what context does the architecture exist in? You know, I mean, there are many artists that will use a very fresh design where all of the lines aren't drawn with straight edges. And then there's, they'll play with shadow shapes across the buildings to create uh, a more interesting movement happening in the buildings. So using those shadow shapes say that it's like the shadows cast from clouds onto the buildings can create some really interesting organic shapes within, say, a side of a skyscraper, you know, or a dappled light on a house from a tree, you know, or the landscaping, you know. So um, there, there are definitely ways to do it, but um, it is, it is absolutely more challenging, but that's part of the fun of what we do. This, the challenge is discovery, and the discovery is what makes us enjoy art making. At least that's what makes me enjoy it. I can't speak for everyone. Sue says, I can take hours to set up a still life, and this is making me feel okay about that. Good. I realize now I could avoid a lot of troubleshooting by doing thumbnails, though. Thank you. That's awesome, you Sue. That makes me so happy. Yeah, I'm just having like a lot of back and forth, like changing a bunch of stuff, just seeing what works, and then just stepping back to my vantage point and seeing what I think. And how can I adjust it? I think this is also a really good way, you know, to illustrate the fact that so much of what we do is really about experimentation um, yes. and feeling the freedom to play around. Well said, Evie. Now, I think that this, this, the reason we wanted to do this and the reason I'm, I'm sitting here doing it with you is to show you kind of what liberties you can give yourself because I think a lot of people think that we, as, as artists, we have it all figured out or we make all these perfect little paintings. Um, and most of the time, every artist has failed thousands of times before they've like gotten successful at something. And so some of it is just trial and error. So it's like, how can we learn faster? And so a lot of what we're doing here is like intentional practice of trying something that isolates just the thing to try and try to do it over and over again until you've figured out a successful pattern format that helps you get 
closer to success with your um, paintings uh, than you were before and to take away the fear because half the time, like FDR would say, the only thing to fear is fear itself. And there's no wrong way to do a thumbnail sketch. You know, I think about like all Zorn's um, thumbnail sketches he would do, and they all, even his sketches and etchings are all hatchy in one direction. You know, they all have hatches that go this like this way. You know, and then there's other people that do vine charcoal or just drawing this in like this, or you might do something that's a bit more graphic. You know, so I'm going to switch over to a pen. And give that a shot for everybody. And maybe I choose just a little section. Or maybe this is the star of the show, this white piece, but I have a few smaller pumpkins around them. Piece of corn. Rotate them a little bit this way. Mm -hmm. And everybody, feel free to send us images of your thumbnails. We would love to see them. Yes. Um, yeah, it'd be awesome. Not bad. It's a bad idea. And the other thing is, is that there's aesthetic decisions you can make in your in your paintings that can make even the most mundane thing that you're seeing in front of you look interesting. You know, and I always think about like people that are like great plein air painters. They they go out and they can make a a scene that just seems relatively bland look just phenomenal. Um, or you got Odd Nerdroom who can paint a brick yeah. and make it look incredible. And it's just a, a brick in the center of the canvas, you know, but it looks so flipping interesting. Put that down. Always thinking about the light. What's the what's the light doing? Is there a good amount of shadow shape for the design? See that doesn't look good with that right there. I really love the cast shadow that the leaves are making on the pumpkin right here. Mm -hmm. I like that. I think even though I'm not completely sold on the composition, I want to just start my thumbnail just so I can see how I can tweak it by doing the thumbnail rather than continuing to adjust and be very indecisive with the objects. I'm just going to start drawing and then maybe I'll figure it out. Those are words to live by. <laughs> I'm just going to wing it. <laughs> Hopefully it works. Mind if I borrow this candle for mm -hmm. a second? Another good design element that you'll see a lot once I tell you, if you haven't seen it before, 
is having one edge of your, of your table come off the side before it goes off your page. So, for example, in this, in this setup, for example, um, maybe I have a little bit of that, that table. Maybe I just say, for better or for worse, I'm gonna have that table coming off the edge. I'm gonna just start with that idea. And then I'm gonna work, I'm gonna build up from there. So I'm gonna pull. This shape It's going to come here. And this one I'm doing it, I'm doing the object first before putting down the. Louis, what day are you most afraid of for this challenge? I do not have a I'm scared days. of all of it. It's <laughs> <laughs> the correct answer. It all is scary. Um, uh, the one I'm most excited that I'm most fearful of when I'm actually painting is probably we have one day called impasto syndrome mm -hmm. where you you are squeezing out a half tube of paint uh, and you have to use each of your colors you have to squeeze out half a tube of paint make sure it's cheap cheaper paint not then have to be student grade but make sure it's affordable colors that you're going to use but um, uh, there's there's part of me that's like pretty excited about about the, the being able to fail at that mm -hmm. because um, it is scary when you're trying to keep control of your painting and you want to paint thinner to do so. But every time that I force myself to paint thicker, I find that I have more control of painting thick than I do thin. But yet even today, I still have to like psych myself into understanding that it doesn't it still feels i don't know there's like an emotional or reaction that i have that, that still states that no 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 this, this isn't right this isn't right you you know you'll lose control and every time that i like fight it and actually paint with more paint i actually find myself not only more happy with the energy that the painting is creating but also finding um, that i actually had more control than i thought i would Interesting. Paul says that apparently there's a problem in France getting access to lead white. Oh. oh, yeah. I think I heard somebody saying something about that recently. Huh. Um, I felt like I saw somebody on a forum not too long ago saying, hey, I'm, I'm not sure where I can get this anymore. I'm trying to find a new way of getting it. Um, 
That's, that really stinks because lead white is such a powerful tool for artists, yeah. you know? So. I know Gamblin has a flake white replacement, which is supposed to emulate lead white, but it's titanium based. I don't know how similar it is, but I mean, when push comes to shove, that might be an option to look at. Yeah, give that a try. I love candles for the reason that you can create them to have like a, wherever there's like a low point of your composition to have that one high moment mm -hmm. that is like straight. It's kind of nice for filling the whole space out. So in this instance, I'm first drawing the items and then thinking about how I would, I would um, make the composition. And this seems pretty strong, actually. Now we'll just put in the value relationships and see what happens. So. Whenever I'm hatching, I'm, for each background, I try to create a, a decently uh, same direction hatch for the whole thing so that every, my mind knows that that's what that is, is, is relationship of the same, it's all the same background. In this instance, I'm going to make it darker, so I'm going to go this way this time. The great thing about these is you can go look at the old masters. There's some that just, you know, they're not, they're not like tight with it. They're pretty sloppy with it. They're just trying to get the point across to their mind. It's not supposed to be perfect. The more you try to make it perfect, the more you will be scared to fail on it. And um, that is exactly the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish here, trying to keep our minds open to experimentation. Yeah. Um, I was doing research on color studies, and I came across a Bougaro one that was I forget the name, but it's like the woman and she's laying down on the grass with like her hands clasped and she's kind of in like a plank position. Um, but he did a color study for that one and it was really refreshing to see the errors that he made in anatomy, which clearly he knows his anatomy. So it's not like you can doubt Bougaro's knowledge of anatomy. But seeing how he didn't necessarily care about it at that moment was really nice. Um, and he just really paid attention to the colors and not the anatomy, which wasn't the reason for the exercise. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, there's something really nice about this setup right here. I might move a few things around, but I kind of like the direction it's going. You never know, like 10 minutes later, I'll be like, I hate it, and then change it for <laughs> tomorrow. But by the way, what, what time are we getting to? Uh, for the video or like time time? Uh, um, how long have we been going? We're at almost two hours. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we're planning on doing is probably calling it 
around two hours. Um, you know, as far as doing our thumbnails, because at the end of the day, just do the thumbnails till you find one that you feel really works. And then once you find that one, stick with it and then see if you can tweak a few things in it. That's also another thing that's great for this, if I, if, especially if it's a vine charcoal or something, because say I wanted to put a candle in and I had the candle right here. I could put the candle in a different spot and see if it worked better. So I could put it right here instead and, and then smudge that one out and see if that looks better, you know, with the composition. And that's one of the beauties, I think, of using vine charcoal as your, as your main media, even though I kind of like the fun texture a pen can give you. Um, but these days are supposed to be nice and sh short and sweet, uh, you know, where you can come play along. But it's to ignite some curiosity and for you to keep going even further with it, you know. Um, don't stop because the live stream stops. Stop when you feel like you've got something that's beautiful that you're really excited about. Yeah, I think being excited about it is one of the most important things. Because if you are just doing it because you feel like you should, you might not have that motivation, that inspiration. And I feel like that's what makes a good painting is that you're excited about it. Yep. It doesn't feel like a chore. I do like the idea of this being really dark here at the lower part. So let's Yeah, there's something nice about this. Another thing you can do is like pull the drapery in an interesting way if you wanted to think about how the drapery would fall if, if you had it coming across or something. Seeing what that would look like. So I feel like there's been several designs that I, th I think will work in be excited about how that's turning out. So do you think you'll stick with one of these designs for tomorrow? Um, I think it'll be, uh, be kind of close. Mm. I, I think it'll be a little bit different, but the idea is that the idea is there. So mm -hmm. I might work on some color harmony things that don't deal with the value, and I might push and pull candle and a few other things mm -hmm. in there. But, um, but regardless, the good thing is, is that it's, you know, it's not going to be something that y'all are going to use as a reference. It'll be more about like, they'll, it'll be there if you want it in, in the live stream, but um, it won't, I'm encouraging everyone to like set it up yourself because that's part of the challenge mm -hmm. is to get used to like pushing things around and being okay with it trying a little thumbnail sketch. If it doesn't work, well, you didn't put a lot into it. It doesn't matter. And you can try something else and see if it works, you know, and keep going until you find the thing that is going to, like, really work for you. So um, I think I might do one more, and then we'll call it. Yeah, I think I'm set on mine. I'm just, like, 
seeing if I might be able to save a few of these other ones. Cool. Okay. Well, this is what every day, this is why, you know, we wanted to, this is a marathon, right? We're, we're doing 20 different days. We want to make sure that not every day you're going to be like burned out by the end of this. So just spend an hour, two hours, you know, just like this. Find something that seems to work. Uh, what we're going to do is then build on the idea a little bit on the next one. So we're going to do a value study, take the same idea, but add more value relationships than we did this time, and we're going to use paint to do it. And then uh, from there, we're going to do a grisaille so that you can get some play with warm and cool relationships so that you feel at liberty to try that. And um, so we're really looking forward to it. If you have any questions, the all of the materials lists should be on every single day. You can click on any day on our calendar. We have a link to the calendar, right? We have a link to the calendar in the show notes. So go down. Click on that, and it'll take you to our calendar. Hover over any of the days, and it'll show you what the subject matter is of that day, what the challenge is for that day. Uh, we'll also be kind of releasing little videos, explaining a little bit on each day. My goal is that you don't have to go buy a lot of supplies. Try to use what's in your home. That's like one of the really big important things for me, is to don't, don't go spending a lot of money on this. This is... If you have a pen to draw with, use a pen. If you have a charcoal pencil, use a charcoal pencil. Um, if you, for like a day for the primaries day, just use the primary colors you have, just a red, yellow, and a blue. If you want the ideal, I'll probably be using a magenta, a, um, a cobalt um, teal, and probably like a lemon yellow. So I'm trying to use like the craziest edge of color primaries that there are and uh, making them into something. If it's the Zorn palette, don't go and buy Vermilion. If you've got cadmium, that'll work. You know, uh, Try to find what you've already got available for you. So uh, I am really excited. I'm hoping that everyone will join each day. If not, these are here for you, free uh, all the way across the board. Really excited to have y'all joining every day. All right, y'all take care.